Um, I'm Paul Smith Keatley, and I've known your teacher now for it must be four, more than five years. More than five, five years. years. Um, I um, teach over here in the UK. Um, I'm also an author. I write books. I'm a photographer. Um, and I work with AI and with robotics and with creative uses of AI. Um, I have, um, I work with a photography company from the Ukraine that uses AI to um, help create really, really clever photographs. Um, I've been working in IT and a similar field for, oh dear, um, 40, 46 years now. Um, and last week I became old enough to have a pension. So I don't really have to work anymore, but I still do loads of other bits and pieces. Have, uh, could you please... Uh... Um, say something about your experiments in robotics. Okay. Um, I used to work with a company called um, Easy Robot. And we used to build robots for education. Um, robotics are... It, it's an interesting area because robotics really sort of intersect and, 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 and links together with AI. And AI at the moment is um, basically the buzzword that everybody wants to connect to it, to everything else. But um, probably six or seven years ago now, I was doing a lecture at um, Cambridge University and uh, I was lecturing to a group of Chinese students. And um, I had a little robot that was about this tall, about um, 12 inches tall, and he had a camera. He didn't have, well, he did have eyes that were LEDs, but up or up here, where the third eye is, he had a camera. And um, he used to work uh, connected to the internet. And I call him he, I, I don't really know. It could have been a he, it could have been a she. Um, if I'd have thought, I would have brought him downstairs. Um, but he would be able to take a picture of somebody. And if they were somebody famous, what would happen is you take the picture and that picture would then go from the robot across the cloud up onto Microsoft servers. And it would be compared with all the people that it knew. And um, what I did for this particular demonstration with, with the Chinese students was to find a whole bunch of Chinese pop stars, um, Chinese athletes, politicians, and I was able to take a picture, hold it up in front of him, and he would then come back and say, oh, that's uh, um, whoever, uh, whether it was um, an actor or a um, a politician or, or whoever. Robotics can do lots of things. Um, some of the really important things robots can do are things that may be dangerous for humans to do. Uh, in particular, um, there are a lot of robots that work when um, uh, when a nuclear power station uh, gets decommissioned, and by decommissioned, I mean um, it's taken out of service and the nuclear core is taken down and put somewhere safe. The problem with that is to get in and do that bit, to get the nuclear material is very dangerous for a human to go in. In fact, you probably, probably there are areas which would kill you instantly. And there are other areas where you would probably be limited to five, 10, maybe 20 minutes max exposure to the amount of radiation without becoming seriously ill. So what they do is they can use a robot 
and the robot can actually behave like a human and can go, can pick things up, can move it to one place, can put it into a container, can seal that container and bring that safely out where it can be disposed of um, securely and safely. Um, you also have instances, um, and you've probably seen these on TV, in, in, in films or TV series, where um, a bomb disposal team, be it uh, a police or, or um, army or whatever, have found an explosive device and they want to um, make it safe, safely. And normally if you, you're you there with um, a bomb disposal engineer, he'll be there with a pair of pliers and a screwdriver and go and start taking screws out and cutting wires and stuff. And if it blows up, obviously it's going to kill that person, which, which isn't a very good outcome. Where if you can take a robot out there, the robot can pretty much do the same kind of thing and... If anything does go wrong, it's only the robot that gets injured. A chicken farm that is probably, I'm trying to think, it's about 10 miles away from where I live, that has the largest number of internet-connected chickens in the world. You may have heard of a thing called the Internet of Things, which is where um, devices and bits and pieces are connected um, to the Internet and do things. I mean, in here, um, in, in my house, 90% of the lights in the house are connected to the Internet and they're connected through Alexa. So I can say things like, Alexa, turn kitchen lights on. And if Alexa's listening, the kitchen lights come on. They have actually just come on. Um, you can see the reflection in my glasses. I'll turn them off. Alexa, yeah. turn the kitchen lights off. Mm. Um, but anyway, this farm has um, all these chickens with little sensors attached. And the sensors go around their middle. And they can tell every time the chicken lays an egg. At the same time, they can also tell where the chicken is. So they can tell whether it's out scrummaging for its own food or whether it's come inside and gone to a food hopper. And it can keep a track, basically, of how often the chicken goes inside and eats and how often it lays eggs and which chicken it is. And it's another one of these perhaps not so nice things that when the chickens get a bit older and they're not laying so many eggs, but they're still eating food, they may well end up going to be chicken that you buy in a shop to eat. Um, but they have, um, I think there's about 125,000 chickens there that are all connected to the internet. Fascinating. Um, well, there are the, the people they still argue that because of the onset of robo robotics and AI, many people are losing their jobs. So this is a quite a trendy topic uh, okay. in every country. Uh, so because of the AI and robotics, many people oh. are losing their jobs. Maybe. Okay. Uh, by 2030, I think uh, India's population, in fact, uh, it, it has already emerged as the world populated country in the world. Maybe by 2030, India is going to be, um, I think, uh, is, is going to dominate a little further. So at the, by that time, I think, uh, um, so India requires a lot of job opportunities because of the population. So do you really think that... Uh, this AI and the robotics uh, take away the jobs from the human beings, especially in Indian context? Um, yes and no. Um, for instance, um, a lot of things, there are a lot of things to do with distribution of, of, of materials that 
robotics and um, AI can be used to take a huge load off that. So some of that kind of thing may, may, may be disrupted, uh, particularly things like um, large trucks that take stuff. I mean, the, the way distribution works is, is you have um, warehouses at one end and you have shops or homes at the other end. And you have to get the stuff from your warehouse to the shop or to the home. The last little bit from getting to the home or to the shop can't necessarily be done by a huge truck. But if you have trucks that go from the, the, the factory or the warehouse to a smaller warehouse where it's then distributed to um, homes and shops, that stretch, um, quite often a big stretch, moving a lot of material, could be done by robotics. You could have an automated delivery system, an automated truck that knew where it was going. It's very simple. It follows the same route every time. Um, so in theory, heavy goods vehicle drivers, lorry drivers could be put out of work. Um, you have things like, um, and I know there are lots of call centers in India, um, that first stage of handling an incoming call from a customer, whether that be to provide support or to do some kind of um, pre-sales job to explain what something can do, is... Um, something that can be handled by a robot, uh, well, a robot and AI, more likely by the AI side of things. Having said that, I have always wanted to write a book. And I get to write stuff and I, I'll, I'll, I'll write a story about something and I'll let my wife look at it and she says, no, I don't like that. You haven't written it the way it needs to be for somebody else to like it. Because in my head, I can understand what I'm talking about, but to other people, sometimes it's like why I love doing things like this with you guys. You can keep asking me questions until you understand what it is that I'm talking about. They Yeah. Yes, when did you design this? This is uh, he's about 10 years old now. Mm -hmm. And um, he's a what they call a bipedal humanoid. Mm. Bipedal because he has two legs. Mm. Um, he has uh, a camera up here. Um, he has fully... Uh, my dog's trying to get in on this. Um, opening um, claws to be able to pick things up. Yes. So what he can see, he can reach and pick things up. Um, he is, uh, well, he's, he's about 40. <laughs> he's about 10 years old. He's about 14 inches tall. Yeah. Um, and... Um, he works with um, the Microsoft, um, uh, the AI that's available through Copilot. Mm -hmm. um, it's been updated so that he can do stuff with that. Um, I didn't actually think to put him on charge and set him up um, because you can do things um, like you can communicate with him. Mm. Um, and you can ask him to wave and stuff like that, and he will mm -hmm. will will do all that kind of thing. Wow, uh, he's, he's he's quite a clever little robot. Well, I say wow. he's quite a clever little robot. Um, it works by having um, the control processor, which is yes, in the back mm. uh, has one processor for running the programs. And then one processor for actually um, controlling all the servos. So each one of these black things, like mm -hmm. uh, yes. here, 
Those are servos, which are little motors, which have um, a limited field of movement. Mm. Um, and each one will move um, like that will move the foot up and down. Mm. Uh, that will bend the knee. Um, and he's quite a good robot. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. 